I don't believe in lucky sevens. I'm not sure about loveness, but I know I believe in angels. I believe in happiness. That is so true. I believe in angels and happiness as well. Thank you, Platinum Planet Records, for that wonderful intro. I am so absolutely honored. I have a great show, a wonderful author connected with us, and she has a beautiful family story behind the book, and she's actually working on her second book. So we will learn more about Yvonne Caputo in just a moment. But first, I'd like to do a shout out to our sponsor. I love NeuroGum and NeuroMints. They are a wonderful sponsor of the show. Now, just in case you want to know where to go get NeuroGum and NeuroMints, I'm going to bring up their information to the screen and then talk about them a little bit because their website is getneuro.com. That's G E T N E U R O.com. And I believe they're offering, oh, well, they were around the first of the year, they were offering a few percent, maybe 10% off your first order. Go onto their website and see because they may still be offering that. However, you can get NeuroGum at your local CVS pharmacy. I'm so excited about that. I actually went into my local CVS and I looked down, you know, around where the gum and everything is kept and there were NeuroMints. And I thought, what? This is wonderful for the company to grow because when it began, they were only available on their website or Amazon and it's really expanded. So what are Neuro gum and neuromints. What's it all about? Well, I'm going to tell you because it has 40 milligrams of caffeine. So that's about a half of a cup of a normal size cup of coffee. And that's a really nice boost. But you know what's going to happen? It's sourced naturally. So it's just going to bring you up to a nice plateau and keep you going all day long. But it's not like this, this harsh crash. And I never, ever have that feeling. And I do love caffeine. <laughs> so I've certainly used those workout products where it's like, yeah, let me go, let me go. And then you feel sleepy at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Not these. Energy, great taste, and convenience in one product. I actually have it right here on my desk. So this is the Neuro Gum and Neuro Mints. The mints I will certainly use during the show. Of course, I don't ever chew gum on camera, right? So I keep that in my purse. And they're great. They last so long. I actually want to show you the blister pack because you know how sometimes you open up gum and it will go stale? Not these. See, I'm not lying. I do use them. You can see, but it is a blister pack so that it stays nice and fresh. And it says functional gum and mints. Why? Well, because it has B6, B12, natural amino acids for focus and clarity. Refresh your state of mind with neuro gum or neuro mints or both. They have great flavors. They have a couple of different mint flavors as well as cinnamon, which is so refreshing. I love cinnamon. So go to getneuro.com, GNC. Amazon, Walmart, or CVS to get this wonderful product. And again, it's getneuro.com, G-E-T-N-E-U-R-O.com, and you can order yours today. All right, so now I would love to talk about the lady of the hour, Miss Yvonne Caputo. And I have her book right here called Flying with Dad, which is also, um, it's a finalist in the Best Book Awards. Yvonne Caputo has been a storyteller all her life. As a teacher, a psychotherapist, corporate trainer, and consultant, she used stories to widen the eyes of her students, soften the pain in the hearts of her clients, and bring a point home for her audience. Caputo has, ma has a master's degree in education and psychology. That's heavy. And that takes a lot of work. She loves history and traveling and lives in southeastern Pennsylvania with her husband and dog. Flying with Dad is Caputo's first book, and she's currently working on her second 
called Dying with Dad, which is going to be a very powerful story because I know what I read in Flying with Dad is a magnanimously powerful story. I can't even imagine what's in her second book. But how about we find out now? Welcome to the show, Yvonne Caputo. And I am so excited to have you with us this this afternoon. I keep saying morning. <laughs> it seems like February is flying by, like by the hours. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here as well. So I read some very interesting things in Flying with Dad, and I'd love to know how did it all begin, but more specifically, what was that moment that you realized, I, I have a book inside of me? Well, it all began in 2008. My father was elderly and disabled and lived on the other side of the state of Pennsylvania. And our way of connecting was a phone call. So when I would call dad, I would hear about his dialysis appointments and his doctor's appointments and the in-home care that he was receiving. And then after that, we kind of struggled with what to talk about next. I was not one of his children who was a sports fan. But on one particular night, he told me this funny, quirky, off the wall story about making an emergency landing in Freed, Belgium in the late winter or spring of 1945. While he was telling me the story, I said to him, dad, I want to get a pencil and paper. This was a normal response from my father. What the hell do you want to do that for? <laughs> I said, I want to write it down because I think this is something that the family would enjoy. So I did that. And then on the very next phone call, I just said to him, I said, if you're willing, start at the beginning. How did you get into the war? I had never heard stories from him. And he was willing. And he started. And story after story after story came rolling off his tongue. And I took notes. And it was maybe about the fourth chapter or the uh, that I had put together that it occurred to me, you know what, I think I might have something. And I did some in uh, some research on the internet. Yes, there were stories about Eisenhower. Yes, there were stories about Roosevelt. Yes, there were stories about the great battles that happened during the war. But you didn't find a lot that was the personal story of an ordinary GI. And for my heart of hearts, it was those ordinary GIs who won the war. So I really felt that there might be an audience for my father's story. So that's when it all started. Wow. Oh, my goodness. You, you know, we were talking about something in the green room, and I actually want to go ahead and ask it now. You had mentioned after the book came out, Flying with Dad, that you did a uh, live, it was almost like a group study at a, a library, I believe, where everyone had already read the book and they had all these questions. Did you have a lot of veterans show up to that? Well, one of the things to think about is that the numbers of World War II veterans that are still alive decrease mm -hmm. every day. They are in their mid nineties, some of them well into their hundreds. There was one veteran there, but he had not of course been old enough to be in the war. And he did say something to me that he felt that I really captured what it was that my father experienced. And, and as a bit of a segue for this, when I had the third draft done, I started looking for somebody to help me publish it. And I'm very clear that I know what I don't know. <laughs> and when I shipped that third draft off to the company, Ingenium Books, that I had chosen, my editor, Bonnie uh, Wagner Stafford, took my third draft, threw it in a blender and sent it back to me. So it was a total rewrite. 
And what she suggested was what you have in hand now. The first section is all about our family. So it really gives context to the man that I describe as dad. The second section is in my father's voice. And Bonnie said to me, I want you to write that entire section in your dad's voice. And like my heart did a stop. I mean, I, it's the first time that I've ever done a book. So I thought, how in the world am I ever gonna do that? <laughs> what happened though, is I have all the letters that my father wrote to me during, or wrote to my, excuse me, wrote to my mother right. during the war. So I pulled this big volume off the shelf and I started reading. And for every chapter where there were letters, I was able to find my dad's voice. And then the third section uh, of the book is how the writing of the book really brought my dad and I to a level that I really wanted, where he trusted me with his heart and soul, where he told me about his nightmares and he told me about the flashback that he had. Mm. Um, it's, it's the coming together of a father and daughter in a way that I never expected. Mm. You, that is an amazing, you know, I, I don't wanna say end to the story because stories always continue to evolve you know, even after someone's passing, we still continue to learn each and every day. But, you know, there is a part in the book, if I may read it, that I found so profound. Um, and this, this, I wrote my notes in here, this is the picnic, where, you know, you're saying, um, let me start at the beginning. When it was time to eat, mom would call us all together. The rough wooden picnic table with laden with kinds with all kinds of mouth watering goodies, but first everyone had to be in place, head bows, and grace said before one mor morsel was consumed. And so that definitely sets the stage, along with many other clues that you give us in, in parts of the story, of you know a very close knit is what we're thinking, Catholic family prays over every morsel that goes into your mouth. And so many, you know, there are millions upon millions of people, Catholic or not, that do that every single day. But you say here later on, on the next page, and this is actually page 37. Dad came and set up the camp stove. It's almost time to eat. Then and only then did Dad come back to join us. I was old enough to be upset about his detachment. And this is describing the picnic where everyone's excited, you get to go to the picnic and the whole family is there and mom has this huge table, wonderful food and you all pray together and then dad just sort of disappears. So I suppose you at that point in time when your father's older, you must have had a strong burning to really make that connection. What was going through your mind as you saw him getting older in your book, you continue to, you know, tell the story about how um, you really wanted what you had in your mind of your father. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that relationship? What emotions were you going through? My father was greatest generation. His role was food on the table, mm -hmm. um, a roof over our heads, and there was comfort because at night, I always knew that he was in the bedroom just down the hall. Mm -hmm. But that talking about important things, what I would have considered to be important things, uh, when I got emotional, when I got hurt, um, if I was having a problem with my friends, those are the kinds of conversations that I didn't have with my father but I did have with my mother. And those were the kinds of conversations that I had always wanted to have with dad. That kind of a thing that made me feel like we were a father and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that just didn't happen when I was growing up. However, with the start of the book and with 
the more that dad told me the stories, the more he trusted me, the more he opened up and let me in to that softer side of him or to that more intimate side of him. And I remember exactly when that shift began to happen. When dad was in Miami Beach for basic training, they were all billeted in a hotel. The Army Air Corps had taken over all of Miami and the hotels were the barracks and the theaters were where education happened and the restaurants were, you know, where dad got his meals. And he said to me, he said, yeah, I lived in a hotel and da, 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 da. So I said, well, where was it? He said, I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but I know that it was on Collings Avenue and he gave me another intersection. So I just got on the internet and I would look for hotels and I would get pictures and I would email them to dad and I'd get a response. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. Until I sent one, the Beach Plaza Hotel, and dad said, that's it. Wow. Good work. Love you, dad. And, and looking back on it, you know, hindsight being 2020, I think at, that was the point where my dad really discovered how curious I was to know him, how curious, how much I would dig to find something, you know, as simple as the name of the hotel that he was billeted in. So I found that after those chapters, he began to open up more and more. Oh my goodness. I just, I love stories like this. I, I grew up Catholic and you know, one thing that, um, and my parents are not of the greatest generation. They're a generation after that really. Um, and you know, but we still grew up not really feeling that we have a whole lot of emotional space to work with. You know, you, you are to be seen and not heard. <laughs> That was said a lot in my household, hearing a parent say, I love you, although they do. And I'm very blessed. My parents are still with us. They do. They showed it in different ways. It just wasn't soft and warm and fuzzy and big hugs. And I love you every morning and notes of I love you. And once you got into studying uh, psychology, because you're a psychotherapist, did you have many um, emotional revelations come to light in your life of saying, okay, okay, I get it. I can understand where they're coming from. Oh, absolutely. Because one of the things that I did in the book is I went all the way back to my grandmother's generation. Okay. And looking at my grandparents and thinking about some of the things that I heard my parents talking about in terms of how they were treated. I can give you an example. My father was raised by my Aunt Josephine because mm -hmm. dad's mom died when he was 10. And Aunt Josephine was 22 when they immigrated to the United States. And she would tell when, when she lived with us, when she was older and she needed a place to stay, um, she would tell my mother frequently, don't tell your children that you love them because if you do, they'll take advantage of you. Now that's in my clear English. Aunt Jo would have said it in her broken Italian. <laughs> um, and then another piece of, uh, of guidance that my mother would give is she would say, Yvonne, don't wear your heart on your sleeve. And I knew that what she meant was I, I was too sensitive, that things bothered me too much, that I would cry at the drop of a hat, you know, um, that I would be a whole lot better off if I didn't do those kinds of things. So uh, when I studied psychology, and particularly when I started to see clients, the understanding that those emotions are there to guide us. Yeah. They're there 
to 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 make us human. Mm-hmm. They're they're there to be a central part of our lives, and when we ignore them, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. Mm-hmm. And of course, now as as a more seasoned therapist, I often say to my clients and to the to the audiences I have when I do stress management training, what do you do? I use this as a symbol. What do you do when you're driving your car and you get to a stop sign? And the audience will say, well, I stop. Well, what do you do next? Well, I kind of look around. Well, what's the reason that you do that? Well, because I want to see if there's traffic coming. Okay. So you stop at a stop sign because you want to avoid an accident. Mm -hmm. And feelings are simply internal, God-given stop signs. And so when we feel things to say, what am I feeling? What's the reason I'm feeling it? And how can I live with this feeling or work with this feeling and proceed safely? Hmm. So using those emotions as guideposts. And that's just not a language my parents had. And that's understandable because if you think about Sigmund Freud, and I have some questions about some of the things that he thought were true. In 1939, he left Austria for England. Mm -hmm. So when you think about psychology, the timeline from 1939 to 2022, it's a short one. So it's in those years in between that we have learned the value of emotions and what they're there for and what to do with them. Absolutely. You know, it was a true evolution that happened of, you know, understanding humans and and what humans need to thrive and the brain and how the brain works and that it all has to come together. And you have another um, scene, I'll call it a scene because it's so visual to me when I read it. On page 45, and this one I put in my notes is the boyfriend. And it says, one day when I was still in high school, dad called me into the living room when I was home from town, when I was home from town. He was standing very still, hands in his pocket. Yvonne, where were you yesterday? I was at the library. His eyes grew sad and his usual brisk tone was gone. No, you weren't. You were seen downtown at the pharmacy with your boyfriend. I am so disappointed in you. Yvonne, I never thought you'd lie to me. He walked past me and out into the dining room. I stood in the same spot for a long, long time. He hadn't yelled or barked. This time it was calm, gentle tone, and the word disappoint that echoed over and over in my brain and shook me to the core. I had let him down. My heart was in my shoes. That, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, this is so familiar. Oh my goodness. So how could that have been turned around to today's terms? What do you think by the time that your father had this evolution, emotional evolution of realizing you want to know about him, you will listen and you'll, you'll listen so much. You're taking notes when he's speaking that he was almost broken down to the point of writing those three words. I love you. That had to be a tearful moment for you to read those words? Um, Well, there's a story behind that. At that point, dad saying, I love you, was something that happened all the time. In 1978, we lost my brother Mark in a really tragic car accident. And what happened to us as a family was after the funeral, when we were sitting together, there was this recognition that things could have been said and never were said. And so we as a family had a discussion that I love you would be the way that we would end every conversation because we never knew that it would be 
maybe the last time we would have the ability to say those words. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was, um, that was just something that was in our family. However, when you, when you talk about that um, email that came back to me, it was the combination of good work and I love you. Those two things that really let me know how extremely pleased he was with what I was attempting to do. And he did see the first draft before he passed away. So here's a really wonderful story. It's a little bit of what do you call them when you when you give away a little something? Uh, a teaser. Or, yeah, a teaser. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, Dad would find himself in the hospital at Christmas time very frequently, mm -hmm. and from a psychological point of view, I really think that it was so that he didn't feel so isolated and alone at that time of the year. Because when he was in the hospital, people would fawn all over him. He was just such a wonderful character. So we went, my husband and I drove back and went to see dad when he was in the hospital. And I had in my hands the first draft. And my husband left to cope, uh, put gas in the car and get us ready for the long trip home. And I picked up the manuscript and I read something to him was one of the stories that really moved me in terms of who I saw my dad as. And when I was finished, um, I put on my coat and went to leave the room. And I said, Dad, I am so proud of you. And he said, what for? Mm -hmm. And I said, because of your service. And he said, no, honey, I'm proud of you. You wrote the book. Wow. Oh, oh my gosh, that is an amazing story. So um, it, it just, it overwhelms me sometimes when I see a picture of my dad or I hear somebody talk about the book. And uh, interestingly enough, on February 10th of 2022, dad would have been 100 years old this very year. So, so whenever I touch base with him again, even if it's simply thinking about him, mm -hmm. the blessing of how well I got to know him just oh. floods over me all the time. There's just such a rich richness. And I say frequently when I'm talking about it because of the way dad's ending happened, I don't grieve the loss of my father mm -hmm. in the way that I did with my mother and my brother and with other relatives because dad and I had gotten to this point um, of what I say, I received the dad that I always wanted and he received the daughter that he didn't know he had. So along with the sadness that still comes up when I think about losing him. There is this joy that also comes along with it. It's that, what I call the divine paradox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I can have those very two emotions at the same time, given what dad and I experienced together. I absolutely love that you were able to be in the present moment and have all those puzzle pieces around you and you put it together and he was able to read the first draft of Flying with Dad before he passed away. That is a magical gift. I have opened up chapter 40 and I'm wondering how long after your mother gave you this advice before you, you started the conversations with your father. It says here, um, Yvonne, if you want to know your father, you will have to go to him. Um, had I known how to follow her advice, I might have gotten to know my father much sooner. So what is the time correlation of when she said, you need to go to him if you want to know him? That was probably my late 20s, early 30s. Wow. And and I I did change. I just wrote about this today because I'm working on a blog. But 
I no longer brought up subjects that would get dad and I into an argument. Huh. I just let them go. And I would focus on the things that I knew were safe or neutral. So when I moved to a, into a new apartment in Erie, Pennsylvania, I asked dad if he would come up with his toolbox and help me to hang a rod in the closet in my new apartment. So we did those kinds of things together. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the boyfriends that I had early on taught me how to work on my car. So I would drive my car home because I didn't have the tools. And I would change the spark plugs and I would change the oil with dad looking on. So those are the kinds of things that we did together. Or when I came home for a visit, he'd ask me if I wanted to go out to the flying field. Dad made radio controlled airplanes. And on Wednesdays and Sundays, he would go out with what he called his fly buddies. So I would do those kinds of things with him. So we weren't at each other like we could have been, you know. So I did take that piece of advice um, to heart, but I was in my 60s. Wow. When the book started. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a picture of him. Can you help us uh, to know the story behind this picture? It is your father. And so he was a member of the 467th Bond Group. Mm -hmm. The 467th Bomb Group had heavy bombers. Mm -hmm. And the picture that you see of the plane is the B-24 with the marking on the tail for the 467th. Um, in 1995, and again, I think twice later, dad was able to go back to England. Mm -hmm. And he went for the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I were there for that as well. But in this picture, he is in the American Library, dedicated to the Second Air Division in Norwich, England. And he is standing in that library beside that picture. So that's when that was taken in one of his trips to England. He looks so excited. He is. Um, to have been back in England, particularly for the 50th anniversary. One of the things that dad said upon his return was that it was amazing how they were greeted by the English. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, the Green Man Pub is where my father would have gone when he was stationed there and not out on a mission, to have what they called at the time a gin and lemon. He hated the beer because it was warm, okay? And um, we went to that Green Man pub on the, uh, in 1995. We walked in and people heard my father's American accent and he was surrounded. People asking him questions and talking to him about his service. And the English are so, um, I'm struggling for a word, but they really will let you know how much they appreciate what the Americans did yes. in terms of coming into the war. So all of that appreciation dad was able to, to, to feel when he made those tri uh, trips. Was that the last time that he was able to go back to England? No. My father hated rock and roll. <laughs> hated it. And he would tell us what awful stuff that was. <laughs> so someone told him that if he had a ham radio, that he could tune in overseas and he could hear his beloved swing music. So... When he got the ham radio, he also learned that he could tune in and he could talk to people all over the world. So on one evening, 
he was um, listening and he heard someone give their call letters and they had a British accent. So dad responded and they started to talk and Ian Denny is the name of the person he was talking to. Ian, uh, dad asked Ian, he said, well, where do you live? And Ian said, well, I live in a little town outside of Norwich. And dad said, oh, my base was right outside of Norwich during the war. So they got into this rhythm of talking about things. And two weeks later, when I went home to visit my dad, on the dining room table was this spread of news clippings and photos and, and all kinds of things that would have reminded dad of his time overseas. Ian and my father continued that friendship over the airwaves until my father died. <gasps> How until amazing died. is that? And when he went in 1995, he met Ian and met his wife, Sue. And, and Ian and Sue came for a visit. Dad and mom went over for a visit after my mother died. Dad went back for another visit. Wow. They became lifelong friends. Oh, what a wonderful story. And all through a ham radio of all things. <laughs> yeah, all through a ham radio. Wow. So did he ever encourage you kids to try to enjoy swing music? Like, you know, He didn't have to encourage it. It is the music I still listen to. Yeah. All right. AirPods in, cleaning the house. It's the Glenn Miller radio on, on um, Pandora. Mm -hmm. And I may be dancing while I'm cleaning. Yeah, I was weaned on swing, so I love it. Oh, I do too. I do. Um, so there was a squirrel nut zippers that came out in the nineties and they were, so they first performed in Asheville, North Carolina. And I was working in Asheville at the time. And I remember going in to see them live. Oh, what a great time. Cause we had that, that little spot in the 1990s where young kids, I was, I was young at the time, but we would go out to clubs and it was like swing dancing clubs and they'd have uh, dancing coaches and oh, what, what a beautiful uh, moment, a beautiful, really, you're so very present with just joy when you're swing dancing with a partner. What One of my favorite pictures is from the Green Man Pub that I mentioned a little bit ago. And Glenn Miller was the orchestra. I mean, there were a lot of other orchestras that, that we really loved, but it was Glenn Miller that was the glue with my mom and dad. And so Glenn Miller's in the mood came over the loudspeakers in the restaurant. And my mother and I were out of our chairs and out on the floor like a shot, jitterbugging to this wonderful piece of music. So she taught me to dance oh, before I have memory of being taught to dance. Wow. Wow. That is so fun. Such joy, right? It what is. So as far as flying with dad, now your second book, Dying with Dad, can you tell us maybe another little teaser? How are they different? Um, how is that book coming along? Um, the book is, for all intents and purposes, finished. It's been through a beta reader. It's been through a, a, a proofreader. The cover design is finished. We're now working on doing a launch hopefully at the end of April. It's really interesting because I never intended to write that book either. When I started getting feedback um, on Flying With Dad, very frequently people would key in on a chapter in the book where I talk about doing a document with my father called The Five Wishes. Mm -hmm. um, Advanced directives um, are the legal documents that let your healthcare agent know when the time comes what you want and what you don't want in terms of what kind of health care you, you, know, you want to have. Well, the five wishes is a document that takes an advanced directive way beyond the scope. Really? Because it asks, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your children to know? Wow. 
Um, what kind of a funeral do you want? All of these really intimate questions that really answer all of the questions that a family might be, have at the end of time. So when I became aware of that document and I did it with my father, when the end came, I knew it all. I knew everything I needed to know. And here I'm not going to do a teaser, but given all of the sacredness that I experienced when the time came, that's what the book is all about. So it is a memoir. It's totally a memoir this time and not a history. And I tell how I grew into being very, very comfortable talking to people about death and dying. Hmm. So um, the beta reader uh, said something that really helped me to understand too what the book was about in terms of a reader's perspective. She said, dying with dad, she didn't really want to pick it up and read it, you know, because <laughs> she knew that it was not going to be an easy topic. But she said that I held her hand all the way through. Oh, that's nice. So if there's anything that I want out of this book, it's for children to have those conversations with their parents and parents to have those conversations with their children. It's so important. Um, and it's what I call um, from psychology, there's an elephant in the living room and nobody wants to talk about it. And that's from drug and alcohol treatment. And actually that saying goes way, way far back in history. But it is hard to talk about death and dying. But the fact that my dad and I were so clear with each other, mm -hmm. it made the process sacred. Sacred in a way that's hard to define. I love the word that you use there of process. You know, through our life, no matter what it is, joy or hurt or pain, we have to process these things. And I've noticed, you know, it, it, there again, it seems like both of our Catholic families were very much on more of the stoic side than it was on the lovey-dovey, you know, I love you every single day side until now we've, we've also had our emotional uh, awakening. And both my parents will say, I love you. And, and that didn't come into light until I started doing it with my own children. But, um, you know, it was just sort of growing up. I remember death as, well, it's just death. They're just gone. We can't process that. That's not an embrace of the life. And they go, wow, this is really something. I mean, it's sad for us until we process. I, I would say, I would have my father back in a heartbeat. Yeah. There's so much I want to know. There's so many questions. I'll be thinking about something and I'll say, I need to ask dad. So on that side of it, you know, um, I feel that. But at the same time, being so intimately involved with him and with that process, I was able to help him go the way he wanted, exactly the way he wanted, because I knew what that was because we'd had these very open conversations about it. I love the fact that there's something out there called the five wishes. How can we get that out there more? <laughs> well, that's one, that's one of, of my uh, goals with this as well. Uh, the end of my full-time career, I worked in a retirement community. And I went into the office of our then National Health Administrator. And she had this blue and white pamphlet laying on her desk. And she said, I've just come back from a conference and I'm so excited about this. This is the five wishes. So I asked her if I could borrow it. And honestly, it laid buried on my desk until one night I got it out and I started reading and I said, I've got to do this with my father. The five wishes, you can look them up on the internet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the ordering the pamphlet cost five dollars. Doing it for yourself, which is something that I've already done and my children have copies. You can do it online now. Um, they will, um, they have other kinds of things that guide you in terms of how you have those conversations with your loved ones. Um, it's an incredible document. Uh, one little thing when I talk to dad about the funeral, because this will give you a picture of my father. So he tells all the things he wants. And then he says, you know how at some funerals they stop and let people talk about the person who's just died? He said, I don't want that. If those folks haven't told me to my face, I don't want them standing up at my funeral. Honest to goodness. Honest to goodness. So guess what we didn't have at his funeral? Wow. You, you didn't have a eulogy. You didn't. We, we had a eulogy from the priest, but we didn't have the, the, the congregation standing up and saying things about Michael Caputo. I love that. What I mean, I think there's a lot of people with the same perspective, myself included. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, there is a huge perception and a reality to that fact that people will say the nicest thing about you when you're dead. When you should really take the moment and realize the only thing we have is right now. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have is this moment between you and I. That's the only thing that's real. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing time to spend that moment. I'm so very glad that you did take your mother's advice. You did find your relationship with your father. And I think Flying with Dad is a beautiful book that everybody needs to have. Everybody would get something out of this. And congratulations on your success with this book. I know the next book is already a success. And I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been lovely. I love that you shared this wonderful picture of your father. We have a viewer here. He said, isn't that the 467th Bond Group? And I, I was uh, making sure that the chat section was active uh, to be able to say, yes, yes, it was. And Absolutely, it's the 467th. Um, if I may tell the viewer who wrote that, um, I, I'm not quite sure because I can't key in on the plane, but if it's the witchcraft, the witchcraft flew 130 missions during World War II with no aborts and no loss of life. It came back with holes. It came back, you know, it limping back into base, but it never, yes, it is the witchcraft. Um, it had this incredible record. Well, what makes it even so more special is that my father was built radio controlled airplanes and he created a model of that witchcraft that now hangs in the American Library in Norwich. He donated it in honor of the men of the Second Air Division. Wow. And yes, your, your person in the chat, Colonel Albert Schauer was definitely my father's base commander. Wow, how interesting is that? Yes, he's writing, I'll read it here. The 467th Bomb Group led by Colonel Albert J. Shower, 1943 to 1946, assigned to RAF, uh, Rackheath? Yes, Rackheath. Mm -hmm. uh, the 15th of April, 1945, they hold the record for bombing accuracy in the 8th Air Force. They put the hurt on the Germans, dug into um, Point de Grave, is that right? Point yes, de Grave. De Grave in the west coast of France. Thank you, Larry, for writing that. Um, wow, what wonderful history, a wonderful story that you were able to put together with your father and find out so much more. And thank you so much for sharing everything with us, especially about the five wishes. If you have not heard of the five wishes, make sure that you go Google the five wishes. It is a wonderful document to be able to put everything together for funeral arrangements, um, information going forward, what you want your children to know as Yvonne has informed us of today and so much more. 
So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. You're very welcome. Have a wonderful weekend. I know you're in Pennsylvania, so be careful. There's wind and snow and more snow. And you've had a very snowy winter so far. Southern, Southern Pennsylvania, not so much. In the north and on the west coast, western part of the state, yes, they have. Oh, my goodness. Well, be safe and, and we will see you very soon. I'd love to have you back on the show for Dying with Dad to talk a little bit more about the book, maybe um, April, May. I'd love to have you on so that we can properly launch that book out there. And, and please, you're a friend of the show. So you just let me know and you're welcome back. Oh, I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you, Yvonne. Have a uh -huh. good day. Yep, you too. Bye bye. Oh my goodness, what a wonderful, wonderful program. I do apologize. Larry is correct. He has corrected me um, accurately. I did type in Bond Group, and I apologize. It's the 467th Bomb Group, is Yvonne's father, and he's a World War II veteran, which has now passed away. But we were talking about Flying with Dad by Yvonne Caputo, which is a wonderful read. So go ahead and go get it to today. And I'd like to say, as always, we are blessed. You are blessed. Mwah. I love you. And stay tuned. We have uh, two more interviews today, one at 7 p.m. Eastern, another one at 9 p.m. Eastern. So yes, Larry, thank you so much. He said, I am getting that book. Yes, please do. All right.